uh, oftentimes, um, for the last couple of years, what I've been doing is, is traveling, as most of you know, traveling full time and doing evangelization and preaching and conferences and parish missions and those kinds of things. And one of the things that I always get is the request for a bio. So I have to send some kind of a biographical thing, sketch on me so that they can do advertising that kind of thing. And on a number of occasions, I've, I've written them and said, okay, well, what exactly are you looking for? And they'll often respond, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I said, oh, it really doesn't matter? I said, fine. So I'll send something like, you know, Father Dave Pavanka is a sinner, uh, saved by grace, just like you, to which they will always respond, well, that's not exactly what we were looking for. So I always, it's like, well, why ask? I mean, if you say whatever you want, when in fact you don't mean whatever you want, because there's this sense of about a biographical sketch is supposed to say things that we've done, the degrees that we have, the whatever, you know? For a second, think about that for yourself. If, if you're requested to do something and send in a bio, what are you going to say about yourself? I mean, what are those things? And so oftentimes the reality is we focus, as I just stated, on the things that we've done. So we go through our bio, and this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, as if this defines us, huh? What if, rather than asking you for a bio, they were to ask somebody in your parish, we need a bio for Father so-and-so, so would you, would you tell us who he is? Now, there's probably a few people in, in, in your parish that you would say, if, if you need a bio on me, talk to them because they love me, and this is, <laughs> this is going to be fantastic, huh? How many of you would say, why don't you talk to another priest? You know, talk to the priest down the road, and, he, and he'll tell you all about me. Huh? I mean, what is it that we want to be presented we live in a culture and a world that says put our best foot forward and, and we get presented and, and introduced in this particular light. It's interesting, uh, if you've read the article in America that they did on Pope Francis, the first thing the author says is he says, so who are you? And Pope Francis says, and I'm sure you've read this, I, don't know, I do not know what might be most fitting description. He paused. And then he said, I'm a sinner. That is the most accurate definition. It is not a figure of speech. It's not a literary genre. I am a sinner. Yes, but the best summary, the one that comes more from the inside that I feel is most true is this, that I am a sinner whom the Lord has looked upon. He repeats, I am the one who's looked upon by the Lord. I always felt my motto by having mercy and by choosing him. This is very true for me. Francis goes on to describe that on the feast as a young child, on the feast of St. Matthew, he had this profound experience of the Lord. So he's always had a deep devotion to Matthew. And for those who've been to Rome, there's a small church near the Pantheon. It's called uh, St. Louis, King of France. And in the front of the church, off to the left, there are a couple of paintings, and they're done by Caravaggio, which uh, Caravaggio's work is just simply beautiful. And one of those paintings is this, the painting of the call of Matthew. And Pope Francis says that whenever, when he was younger, in, in a bishop, in a, eventually archbishop, he would go, cardinal, he would go to Rome, and he would go to this small church, and he would go up to the front left, and he would sit there, and he would pray and reflect on Caravaggio's calling of Matthew. And he says, why? Because that is me, Pope Francis says. I feel like him. I feel like Matthew. This is me, a sinner on whom the Lord has turned his grace. So they ask for a bio for Pope Francis, and he says, a sinner. Apparently, if you're a pope, you can do that. If you're just a normal priest, you can't do that. The Holy Father introduces himself as a, as a sinner. And one of the things that if we study the Holy Father, and I've had the opportunity uh, over the last about year uh, to give kind of some talks on Francis and, and how Francis sees the church, but in some ways more specifically how Francis sees us. Those who know much more and who have studied Pope Francis say that while Francis was the provincial, and while Francis was bishop and as his archbishop and cardinal, one of his primary purposes and one of primary focus that he had was on priests. 
Pope Francis is quoting as saying, any true, authentic, sustained renewal that's taken place in the church started within the priesthood. He said, if there's going to be renewal and transformation in the church, it must start with the priest. So Francis has a deep love and a deep devotion to the priest. And I think in many ways, what he's teaching us, brothers, is how to be priests. That if we watch and we look at Francis, just look at the images that he's doing, and we focus on Francis, he's teaching us what it is to be a priest. I remember before Holy Thursday last year, I said to a friend of mine, I said, it will be interesting to see how he handles the washing of the feet. And this was before anyone knew what he was going to do. We all know the story. He goes to a prison and he washes the feet of convicts, both male and to the horror of many, female. Huh? How could he? Which brings us to what Bruce was saying last night, that Francis is saying, and this is what he's saying about the church, so oftentimes we are focusing on the wrong things. There are literally people dying around us and we're focusing on the wrong things. Huh? I think we need to be able to look and look at how Francis is leading and, and what is he teaching us about being a priest. And just by watching him and the things that he does and the way he reaches out to people and the way that he behaves, what is that teaching us being a priest? I mean, we, we look at the basic symbols that he's used. I, the day after he was elected priest, they bring a uh, Holy Father, they bring out these new shoes and all that kind of thing. And Pope Francis is like, well, why do I want those? Well, these are the shoes that a pope wears. And Pope Francis's response was, I already have a pair. Huh? I already have a pair. Why do I need another? There, there, there's something about what Francis is doing that's teaching us to be priests. Huh? And I think one of the things that he shows first and foremost uh, is that the priest has got to be humble. We take a look at John's Gospel, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 30. He must increase and I must decrease. It seems to me, brothers, that this is at the heart of renewal in the priesthood. That's difficult for us. Huh? That's particularly difficult for us as priests. This idea of, of we must decrease and the Lord must increase. Because as priests, we're not going to start until Father's there. Okay, now that Father's there, we're going to start. Don't sit there. That's Father's chair. What does Father think? What does Father want to do? What's Father's opinion on this? Does Father know this is going to happen? I mean, we live so oftentimes in this church that surrounds us as, as, as Father, Father, Father. And I remember when, when I was working here one time, I was calling the, the students I needed to make some phone calls, and and I called this person, and they answered the phone, and they were very short, and they were like, what do you want, and, and very grumpy. And, and I talked with them a little bit, and they said, well, who is this? I said, well, it's Father Dave. Oh, hi, Father. How, what can I do for you, you know? <laughs> well, well, right over here by the McDonald's one time, I was, I was merging on, and, and somebody honked the horn as if I would actually cut somebody off, which I would never do. And then they realized it was me, that it was a priest, and they were mortified that they actually honked at a priest. I mean, their salvation was in jeopardy at that moment, that they would actually honk at a priest. I'm going to dinner on Wednesday night, and the wife said, whatever you want, Father. Whatever you want, I'll make for dinner. To which the hu husband responded, we need to talk. Huh? <laughs> it's hard for us to be small. What does it look like for uh, the Lord to increase and for us to decrease, we who are priests, who are used to so many things revolving around us? in everything beginning and ending in, in, around us. I remember, actually, I, I just got an email from my father this morning. Uh, I walked the Camino. I think some of you know that. I walked 500 miles across Spain. And actually, today was the day I finished. Uh, eight years ago today, I'd finished walking 500 miles. I never remember this, but for some reason, my father remembers. So he sent me an email this morning, and, and the priest I was walked with congratulating us on finishing. Huh? Well, Father Joe and I had this this rule as we began the Camino, and that rule was is that we were never going to play the priest card. Now, do I have to explain to you what the priest card is, or is everybody pretty clear what the priest card is? Huh? The priest card is that says that, that we should get some deferential treatment or, or be treated because we're priests. And Joe and I made it very clear that we didn't want that. We didn't want this preferential treatment because we were priests. Huh? 
And we were dressed in just shorts and hiking clothes, so most people didn't know we were priests. So we would have conversation with people for a long time until they actually, conversation become more personal about, you know, why are you doing the Camino? Very common, and I would always say, I'm doing the Camino in gratitude of being a priest. I love being a priest, and I wanted to do something to say thank you, Lord, for letting me be a priest. I remember one woman, she, she was from Australia, and we were talking. Eventually, it came that we were priests, and she said, I couldn't imagine that you were priests. And I said, well, why? And she said, because you talk to me. She said, my priest would never talk to me like you guys do. So we made this deal. We're not going to pull the priest card, ever, except for once. So we're walking. There was this one route from the very beginning, uh, the year before I left, this, several people told me, you have to go to this particular monastery. It's just a gorgeous monastery. It's a Benedictine monastery. And to make the decision to do that, we actually had to walk about seven or eight miles out of the way. So when you're walking 500 miles, seven or eight, it's not a big deal. But it was a couple of hours extra out of the way to go to this monastery. We arrived at the monastery at around 8.59 in the morning. And they were closing it at 9. We had walked probably hour, two hours out of the way to go to this monastery. Joe and I look at each other, quite certain that if we simply say, excuse us, but do you know who we are? Huh? <laughs> we decided not to. We just, OK. Close the door because nobody else got to get in. So all the grace that I had received from that, I just blew because I expected you guys to clap for me and say, you're such a good priest, huh? How do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile the priest card with he must grow greater and I must grow smaller? Brothers, how do we reconcile the priest card, which says some type of deferential treatment, some type of special treatment, some type of I'm father? How do we reconcile that, this, this priest card that, that at one time or another, I'm sure I cash in, we all cash in, huh? with the humiliating execution of the high priest? I mean, how do... How do we reconcile these things? This, this, this desire that we have, uh, spoken or unspoken, subtle or not so subtle, that I'm a priest. And because of that, I should get certain things or I expect certain things. And reconcile that with the high priest suffers a brutal execution. A high priest who says, I have come not to be served, but to serve. How do we figure that out? When, when so much of the attention is on us and, and on what Father says and on what Father wants, huh? If you haven't read Evangelii Gaudium, please do. It's, it's, it's a great, great document. But the Holy Father says in Article 104, he says, the ministerial priesthood is one means employed by Jesus for the service of his people. Yet our great dignity derives from baptism, which is accessible to all. Huh? I mean, let's be honest. Who of us thinks our great dignity comes from ordination? But the, but the Holy Father is saying, and it's right, fundamentally what opens up salvation is baptism. That I'm not saved because necessarily because I'm a priest. I'm saved because I'm baptized. And, and in that, the Holy Father says that that's accessible to all. That everybody who is baptized, that there's a grace and there's a beauty and there's a dignity about that individual. And he goes on to say that that comes about from baptism. That what makes us great and what makes us wonderful and what makes us special is the fact that I am baptized as is the brother or sister next to me. The Holy Father says the configuration of priest to Christ as head, namely as the principal source of grace, does not imply an, exalt an exaltation which would set him above others. Huh? I believe it was Augustine that says, in the end, I'm more impressed that I am brother, huh? that I am brother, that we are both baptized, that you are baptized, and I am I'm more impressed by that 
than by the fact that I'm bishop. We must grow smaller, and he must grow greater. The Holy Father said something interestingly. If I was in the seminarians, I'd, I'd enjoy sharing this. He says that his fear is that what we are doing in seminarians, in seminaries, are we are raising little monsters. Huh? That's what he says. That we are creating little monsters. He says clericalism is the great sin of the age. Huh? This this sense that we come out of seminary and now that I'm ordained and and now that that we have unbelievable graces and powers that, that we have the ability to confect the Eucharist and subtly that does something to us that says th that not that we're not great but that we're better or we deserve different. And how do we reconcile that with Jesus who offers his life and is crucified? How do we reconcile those two things? I think that's the, that's the battle and the struggle that we have as priests. That, that how does this come together? This tension that we have that, that makes us such unbelievably visible people that, that in one level it makes sense that, that what does Father desire and what are we thinking and all those kinds of things, but we have to wrestle with this, this desire that it's all about me, huh? We think it's all about us. And brothers, it's never been about us, huh? But that it always has to be about him. Tragically, in the last 20 years, we, we take a look at, at what's taken place. And I think I mentioned this last year. Uh, if you have the stomach for it, Google Catholic priest and begin to read. And what comes up is just some awful, awful things. So in many respects, not just the church, but the whole world, at least in, our, in the Western culture, is looking at priests because of the things that have taken place over the last 20 and 25 years. I was sharing with Dr. Healy yesterday that we have a generation of young people uh, that for the, all they've ever known is scandal. All they've ever known, their whole existence is, is Catholics. They've known pre-scandal. And every month, every eight, two months, that something new happens on television and that we live in a world that, that the culture and the media is looking at the priest. And unfortunately, brothers, we've brought that on ourselves as, as priests. Huh? Maybe not as individuals, but as priesthood, we've brought that on ourselves. And, and what I suggest is, is that it's a wonderful opportunity that we have now that, that if we just look at that image, that image of uh, of the eyes of the world, the eyes of the culture, the eyes of the media looking at us, that we can slowly turn them from that to Jesus, huh? We've captivated their attention now, and they look at us and they see us, so we've got a great opportunity, brothers, to be able to turn their eyes. Huh? When I travel, most of the time, um, I'll travel in clerics, not necessarily in a habit, for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of people don't know what to do with me as a habit. And, and going through security, I mean, I've had to raise, I mean, it's just, let's just say it's awkward, huh? <laughs> I feel like that scene from, uh, what was it, Braveheart, you know, the, anyway. <laughs> but the other thing is, I want to be seen as a priest. I don't want people to look at me, it's like, what is he, huh? I, I may have shared this before. I, I was sitting in, in BWI a number of years ago dressed in a priest and on every television in the entire airport was the whole priest scandal and this was they were trying to link it with the Holy Father, uh, the case in Chicago, the Holy Father and his knowledge and all that. And I'm there and this is on every television in the airport and I'm standing there as a priest and everyone stopped. The, everyone in the airport literally stopped and just stared at me for about 20 minutes, huh? I want to be seen as a priest today. I want to be recognized as a priest. Because, brothers, we have now the opportunity to turn the attention away from ourselves and the focus not on me, but on Christ. Huh? Because it's never been about me. It's always been about Jesus. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And unfortunately, because of the culture and the world and the way the church is off time, we make it about me. We make it about Father. We make it about me. And, and we have to resist that, that, that it's not about me. It's about Jesus and it's about Christ who lives in me and people discovering that and seeing that, not me. And the challenge so oftentimes for us is, is because of circumstances, because of culture, because of structure, we make it about me, huh? 
And brothers, we need to move the attention and the focus away from ourselves to Christ. I love what Paul says in Corinthians, that he says, I came to you, I wasn't the best speaker, I wasn't very eloquent, and what did I do? All I did is I preached Christ and Christ crucified, because that's the only thing I have. And that's the challenge before us, brothers, that we preach Christ and we preach Christ crucified, and that in that, it is he who lives in me, huh? It's not just this little bit of Jesus that's been placed in me. Rather, it's that I've been placed in him. It is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, huh? And, and we get lost in that. And that's, that's actually the goal. That's the desire. Paul says in Corinthians that it is he who lives. The Holy Father says, in, again, in Evangelii Gaudium, in Article 38, he says that we must help focus the attention of everyone and focus the attention of the people in the church on Jesus and move it away from us. And he says something beautifully. He says that we need to, he's speaking about preaching. Huh? I love, if you've read this, the, the text he says about preaching, he says, unfortunately, many people have had to suffer through our homilies, huh? He says that we need to preach more about the church. We need to preach, are we preaching? He says, are we preaching more about the church or more about Christ? Because so oftentimes our preaching is about the church and about church things. Not to say that we never mention those, but he says that if our preaching is more about the church than it is about Christ, something is wrong. And he goes on to say, if we're preaching more about the Pope than we are about God's word, something is out of order. It must be about Jesus. And us collectively, brothers, as priests, turning the attention and the focus of a population and a generation to Jesus. Amen? I remember I was, I was traveling one time, and I was in actually in North Carolina, and a friend of mine picked me up, and we are just talking, and this was a good friend of mine who's known me for a long time, and, and we were talking about there was this group of people that were waiting for me to arrive, and, and there were, yeah, there were just excited and this kind of thing and that and the other and I shared with him I said I wished I could be invisible I wished I could I wished I could come in and and just preach and do what I do and I could just be invisible and I could just leave and and he goes well here's his moment of honesty huh he says well maybe you probably shouldn't publish books if you want to be invisible and think about that I mean how how is it brothers that we're supposed to be invisible I mean we're not going to start Mass until we get there. Rarely do they start a sacrament of reconciliation without us. Huh? How is it that we can be invisible? Huh? The only way is that it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That, that I get lost in Him. That it's not it's, it's not you who loves, but, but that, that you become so consumed by the love of Jesus that, that he loves, huh? That we're able to love because of him, that we're able to be patient because of him, we're able to, to be forgiving because of him. That the only way that I'm going to be invisible, brothers, is, is that if I become so much like Jesus that, that that's what they see. That it's not just, and that's not to say that we lose our personality or anything like that, but that there's something about us that when they look at us, it reminds them of Jesus and speaks to them about Jesus so that it's not me that becomes the focus and the attention, but it's him. Yeah, I remember when, when I began the Camino, I prayed this dumb prayer that was a zealous prayer that said, Jesus, do whatever you need to do to make me holy, huh? And then I just found myself reflecting on, on things that, that are about me that aren't holy. And I said, well, I, I said, Jesus, I just give you permission to take everything away. Take everything away that isn't you. Imagine if we did that, if we said day after day after day, Jesus, strip me of everything that is not of you that I desire to be your priest and I desire to, to reflect you, so take away everything so that the only thing that remains is you. Strip me, break me, empty me. So that when people look, the only thing, brothers and brothers, the way that we come to that is that we come to before the Lord and we try to reflect and, and see what it is that keeps us from being able to see that or to be able to do that or to be able to experience that. And I suggest, brothers, that for most of us it's pride. For the Franciscan, the primordial sin is this sense of, 
of pride and, and trying to take things upon ourselves that don't belong to us. And we often focus on stuff. And Francis was saying it's not just about stuff that we try to accumulate. It's, it's honor and prestige and recognition and respect. Reputation. I love what Ann Shield says. Sister Ann Shield says, the only one that's concerned about reputation is the evil one. Huh? That we get so consumed about how people see us and reflect on us. Huh? I love the text from Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Imagine the scene. Jesus is walking with the disciples. And Jesus summoned them and he said, you know those who recognized as rulers and Gentiles lorded over them. And their great ones have their authority felt. But it shall not be like that among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you must be the servant. Whoever wishes to be first must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why can't we do that? If we recall, the reason Jesus spoke of this was at the time when James and John were debating who's greater. Isn't that a great image, huh? Who's, I mean, they spent all this time and they're having this debate of who's greater. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm better than, than you. You're better than, I mean, they're having this debate and Jesus reminds them that, that he came not to come to, to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. Why can't we experience that? Brothers, I believe it's because of pride. C.S. Lewis says, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, all of that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. C.S. Lewis goes on to say, it is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, in every family, since the world began. Think of your confession. Think, I think of my confession, huh? How often we focus on impatience or unchastity or pornography or self... I mean, pride. Pride leads to every other verse. I love that, that, that it is a flea bite in comparison. As I was preparing this homily, or this talk, I received an email from a woman who prays for me. And this is a side note. Uh, but make sure you have people who pray for you. And I don't mean just somebody who says, oh, I pray for you, Father. There are about a half a dozen people over, I've been ordained for 18 years, half a dozen people who we, they and I have had this conversation that part of their ministry is to pray for me. Uh, and, and they experience suffering and difficulties and struggles. I mean, in one sense, my mother is one of these people, huh? I, I've been to China twice in the last two years, and both times I went there, she was admitted to the hospital of, of certain things, huh? I think there's something to that. There are people who write me, and, and they're just like, what the heck is going on? And they're experiencing great. Well, this woman just wrote me. She's one of the ones who prays for me. Had no idea what I was doing this week. Uh, she knew I was... I was uh, going to be with priests, but she says, peace and blessing. Our Lord is asking these men to come and be emptied and be humble. Please communicate them the necessity to acknowledge that they only have li that, they, that, that they be little and that the Lord can bless and multiply them only if they become little. A proud heart is an obstacle to the action of the Holy Spirit. And they will never experience the Lord's power until their pride has been put down. Father Dave, please pray for them that they may receive this great grace. As you know, they must stay little and out of his way. This woman had no idea what I was praying on, no idea what I was talking on. And I get this, and it's like, this is it, brothers. That we even, and many times we make our pride prideful. It's it's we make our pride about ourselves. It's like I'm so prideful. And the reality is, is think about the oftentimes, how oftentimes we actually repent of pride, huh? We focus so much more on these very external things, but, but pride <coughs> is at the heart of them all. I 
but we make pride about ourselves. It's like I'm so prideful, and I, 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 I. What does pride allow us to do to other people? How does pride allow us to, to ignore people in our parish because, because they're different or because I don't like the way they think? Or I don't. Pride causes us to ignore, to dismiss, to discount people around us that the Lord is inviting us to love and inviting us to love with the love that comes from him but because of our pride. Our pride won't allow us to admit we're wrong. Our pride won't allow us to give in or to surrender or to change our mind because I'm Father. Our pride must be rooted out. Our pride, brothers, causes us to see one another as competition. Again, on the Camino, we were walking, Father Joe and I were walking one time, and these people passed us. We were walking along, and these these other couple of pilgrims passed us. It was like, I, I would love for you to say that I'm not joking, and I'm joking maybe a little bit, but it bugged me that they passed me. It's like, I'm one of, there are five boys in my family. Everything was competition. Every, me and my brother, we would go and get blood. And we'd have a competition on who could do it faster. It's like, come on, come on. It's like, this is ridiculous. Ridic- I mean, every, so these people, they passed us. It's like, Joe, we just got passed. If you wouldn't have had to go to the bathroom, we wouldn't be passed, huh? It's like this, and I'm thinking, I found myself, this is ridiculous, but why does this bother me? Because I see them as competition, and they're not competition. And I think oftentimes, brothers, we see one another or other parishioners that may have particular gifts or talents as competition. And they are not, we are not competition to one another. So when another brother or priest gets honored or gets some special dignity or award or something like that, why is it just gnaw at us? Because we're not all Jesus, because Jesus isn't radically rooted in us. And it reminds us how much more we have to go. And how much more we have to go to that place where he says, it is not I who live, but it is you who live in me. Why is it that it bugs us that that Father Joe gets recognized and I don't? Because it's the flesh. It's me who lives in me, huh? Because I work a lot harder than him. And I know that actually, I know what's going on behind closed doors, huh? It reminds us, brothers, that it is the flesh. And it's not radically and fully Christ who lives in me. So at the scripture in Kenosis, in in, in Philippians 4, I think 4, 2 maybe, 2. We all do. We read it every Saturday evening. Huh? Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God. For the Franciscan, that, that, that prayer of self-emptying, that God empties himself, huh? that, that, that's, that's got to be our prayer, brothers, is, is that we go and we allow ourselves to be emptied, that self-emptying, that kenosis, so that the only thing that remains is the Lord. Lord, empty me, break me, strip me, do whatever you need to do, and we need to be able to go before the Lord and give him permission to do that. Strip me of my pride, of my arrogance, so, so that you may reign, so that you may rule, so that you may be the Lord, so that we can come to this place where we're actually humble. Huh? And here's the issue that I have with humility, and I think it's a good thing to have. So I'll hear people talk about, you know, this person is so humble, and so I begin to ask them, it's like, well, what is it about them? And, and almost always, inevitably, it's like, well, they're so quiet, and they're so... Quiet is not things that people generally say about me, all right? So this sense of, of humility, if you're really going to be humble, then you, you have to be more quiet, and you probably bow more. Humble people probably bow more, they do. And There's just something about being humble and... Humility is you being you. It, it, it's me being who I am. Francis said, what we are before God is what we are, huh? St. Francis. This whole having a pope for Francis as a friar is very confusing, all right? So St. Francis says, what we are before God is what we are. That, that, that for me to be humble doesn't mean that, that I necessarily have to talk less, but But it's allowing the Lord to be who he is for me and me being who I am before him. And in that, there's humility. It's recognizing the Lord in his goodness and his love and who he is and 
in recognizing who I am in relationship with him and that it is there that I draw my dignity and my value and my worth. And, and no matter what happens to anybody else, that doesn't change. So I'm walking the Camino and somebody passes me. doesn't make me less of a person. My value and dignity isn't in the reality that I can walk faster than somebody else or, or that I can pray more than somebody else or that I can preach better than somebody else or that I have a larger attendance in my parish than somebody else. That doesn't give me value, worth, and dignity. What gives me value, worth, and dignity is the reality that I am a son of God baptized and saved by Jesus. And that's what gives me worth. And the more we come to understand that and live that, brothers, then, then other people receiving <coughs> accolades doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't take something away from me. It's not something, it's, it's not that, that I have been diminished because they've been honored. Or, or that somebody becomes pastor a year before I did, and even though I've been a priest longer, what does that take away from me? Nothing. Nothing. But when it's, when it's the flesh, and more of the flesh, huh? So we pray for humility. And what is one of the gifts of humility is service. You know, I have come not to be served, but to serve. And, and it's not just service, well, I hear the confessions and, and I do mass and that's my... It's, it has to be more than that. It's a way of life. It's not, it's not this is what I'm doing and I've served and I'm done. One of the things the Holy Father talks about in this document is he says that we as priests, we guard our, our free time so much. It's like we obsess. And he's not saying we should never have free time because we should. But he says that at times we obsess is the word. We obsess over our free time. That this is my time, huh? As if all time doesn't come from the Lord, huh? And it isn't just, we serve now and I don't have to serve then. I remember as a novice, I was in Altoona and we, were, we did the RCA service and the Easter vigil and, and great, I mean, all that goes with the Easter vigil and, and the glory and the grandeur and the, everything was just fantastic. It was a beautiful and a big party and afterwards, myself and the novices were walking through the church and at the front of the church, vacuuming the church was the pastor. I mean, this was a kid, a novice, 23-year-old kid, profound impact on me seeing the pastor who was just the one everything was the pastor and he was at the end of the evening when everybody had gone home was vacuuming and cleaning up something had a profound impact on me. do do our parishioners see us as servants now they see confessions and priests and all that as our job do they see us as servants and one of the things i think is important is the servant isn't one who holds ownership, huh? That there's something different that between owners, huh? Servants don't act like owners. And oftentimes I think that we see our ministry as something that we own. We see our parish as something that we own. Huh? This is mine. It's not. I don't have to tell you that. It's not. It's not ours, huh? The other thing, and we've heard this time and time again, one of the greatest acts of service that I can do for my ministry and the people that I'm called to serve uh, is to pray is to pray, is to go into the chapel, go to my room, close the door, and pray. I remember when I was uh, in seminary, I was in Fort Worth, Texas, and it was a Monday morning, and this guy comes in, and he was irate, comes into the office, and just frustrated, and apparently on Saturday afternoon, he had come to the rectory, and, and knocked on the door, and rang the bell, and waited for 10, 15, 20 minutes, all the priests were gone, there was just nobody there, he was I rate that there wasn't somebody there Saturday afternoon when he needed them. How could you not be there for me? Which caused me as a seminarian to begin to reflect. What is reasonable that people can, what's a reasonable expectation that the, that the people of God can have on us? Is it reasonable to expect that we can be somewhere at the rectory 24-7 whenever, no, that's not reasonable. But I was convicted at that time what is reasonable is that the people of God can expect that we pray. It's reasonable. It's reasonable that the people of God can expect that you, as their priest, praise. And I think one of the greatest service that I can give to the people that, that I'm going to do a parish mission coming, that I spend time before the Lord and pray. One of the greatest acts of service. Amen? Amen. How are we doing? Okay. There's an article of which I did not copy. 
It's called, uh, I mean, the title of this article is Be Because Beset by Weakness. Okay? And it's written by a Jesuit by the name of Michael Buckley. And he's talking about achievements and, and what's going to be a good, who's going to be a good lawyer, who's going to be a good this, that, and the other. And he says, because a man is religiously serious, prayerful, socially adept, intellectually perceptive, possess, possesses interior integrity, sound common sense, habits of hard work, therefore he would make a fine priest. Father Buckley goes on to say, I think that is a trans, I believe that that transfer is disastrous. This is a different question. One proper to the priesthood as one's very essence. Is you not uniquely proper? The real question is, is this man weak enough to be a priest? Is there any history of confusion or self-doubt or interior anguish? Has he had to deal with fear, come to terms with frustration, or accept deflated expectations? Weakness. And he goes on to say in Hebrews, for he himself has suffered, has been tempted. He is able to help those who are tempted. Therefore, we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset by weakness. Are you weak enough to be a priest? You see, I was talking at the beginning about all of these attributes that, that we want to present ourselves, and I think that's part of the problem, is that we oftentimes present ourselves as, this is who I am as priest, and this is all the, the things, everything is in place, and everything's in order. And, and his premise is that, in fact, that separates us from the people. Are we weak enough to be a priest? And he does this beautiful image. He, he, he compares Socrates and Jesus. And I'm just going to read this. It's, it's about two paragraphs. He says, Socrates went to his death with calmness and poise. He accepted the judgment of the court, discoursed on the alternative suggested by death, and on the dialectic indications of immortality found no cause for fear. He drank the poison, and Socrates died. Jesus, how much the contrary, Jesus was almost hysterical with terror and with fear, with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. He looked repeatedly to his friends for comfort. He prayed for an escape from death, and he found neither. Finally, he established control over himself and moved into his death in silence and lonely isolation, even into the terrible interior sufferings of the hidden divinity or the absence of God. At once I thought this was Socrates and Jesus suffered different deaths, the one so much more terrible than the other, the pain and the agony of the cross so overshadowing the release of hemlock. But now I think that the explanation is different and it runs much deeper. Now I believe that Jesus was a more profoundly weak man than Socrates, more liable to physical pain, to weariness, he was more sensitive to human rejection and contempt, more affected by love and hate. Socrates never wept over Athens. Socrates never expressed sorrow and pain over betrayal of a friend. He was possessed and integral. He never overextended, convinced that the just man could never suffer genuine hurt. And for this reason, Socrates, one of the greatest and mo most heroic men who has ever existed, a paradigm of what humanity can achieve within the individual, was a philosopher. And for the same reason, Jesus of Nazareth was a priest, ambiguous, suffering, mysterious, and salvific. So with us, a priest must be liable to suffering. He must be weak. He must become like the one he touches, the body of Christ. Brothers, if it's going to be the Lord who lives in us, 
and the Lord growing greater and we growing smaller, we must come to peace with our weakness, with our struggles, with our difficulties, with our doubts, with our fears. Unless we're able to do that, we can't really radically connect with the people of God because that's where they all are. If we present ourselves as one who has never doubted the Lord, how can somebody who doubts the Lord feel like that we can relate to them? I've read a, a book and they were talking about Ireland in the Middle Ages. And in Ireland in the Middle Ages, they would take the problem priests and the alcoholics and they would move them to the monasteries. And where would the people go if they really needed to talk to somebody who would be honest with them? They would go to the monasteries because no, they, they knew that if they went there, they, they would find a priest who could understand their struggle and their difficulties, and their fears, and their brokenness. It's a, it's a paradox, brothers, but we try to present ourselves as having everything together. And what I think the people of God need is, is they need to be a priest that's more like Jesus, that, that struggles and that has difficulties and weeps and, gets, and feels the sorrow and the pain of somebody betraying us. It's because of our weakness that the Lord will ultimately live more in us. It's embracing our weakness. It's embracing these fears. It's embracing these difficulties. It's embracing these struggles. That it's because of that that people will be able to see Jesus in us. It's not getting past all of those things. It's not getting past it. Rather, it's embracing us. If we try to present ourselves as being perfect all the time, the people of God, well, they don't want a perfect priest. They want a human priest. And, that, and that's, not, that's not sin. I mean, there's something different about sin. And we know this, brothers. Sin is sin. But even in that, and this is, I think, one of the beauties of the Lord, even in our sin, the Lord transforms me. Then in my sin, I recognize my radical need for Jesus. Rather than judging myself in moments of grace that I sin, that I fall, and in, in grace and humility I go before the Lord and I'm reminded that I need you. I'm reminded that in my pride I look at myself and my sinfulness and how bad I suck and I've done this again and I can't believe I've done this again. Or it can be a moment of grace that says, Jesus, I'm lost without you. And there's no way that I can do this without you. And the Lord can actually use our brokenness and our tendency in, in, in our ability to fall or to sin or to turn away to actually bring us to him and to humble us, not to humiliate us, but to humble us and remind us that I can do nothing without him. That I am radically and desperately in need. That I am weak. And I think Paul said something about when he is weak, that the Lord is strong. And something about boasting in his weakness. If we are going to be able to say, as John said, that the Lord would grow greater and we would grow smaller, brothers, a part of that is that we recognize our weakness and our absolute need for the Lord. Huh? I mean, how can, how can we celebrate the Eucharist? How can we take the bread and the wine and pray and realize that that bread and the wine has become the body and blood of Christ and not think of a broken body, huh? And, and that that's what I want to become. How, how, how can we not think of smallness and, and humility and littleness as we give the body of Christ to our brothers and sisters and, and they take it on their tongue and their hand and they consume that? How can we not become small allowing the Lord to break through and reveal himself to us and reveal the, to the world through us and through our priesthood, through our ability to embrace our weakness and our brokenness and, and, and even our sinfulness and our smallness and, and being little in all of that, allowing the Lord to be revealed in our weakness and in our brokenness. And brothers, as is this author, the Jesuit father says, is that when we see Jesus in that, huh? congregation the people that we serve see in that something that they can relate to that says that's me let's pray
Jesus, that you would grow greater and we would go smaller. It's not I who lives, but you who live in me. Jesus, root out, root out the pride that causes me to think that it's about me and, and that everything depends on me. It's about you, Jesus, and it's about your power, and it's about your sovereignty, and it's about your mercy. It's about your grace. It's about your precious blood being poured out upon me. It's about you growing greater and I growing smaller. Jesus, I ask your Holy Spirit upon us who are priests... that we would embrace your broken body with our broken body. That we would be made whole. Jesus, give us Give us the light and inspiration of your Holy Spirit that, that we can see you as you are and see ourselves as we are, Lord. We pray for the, the, the virtue and the gift and the grace of authentic humility, not false humility, not acting like something we're not, authentic humility that says what we are before what we are is, and nothing else. Huh? Jesus, give us courage. Give us courage to be able to admit to the people of God vulnerabilities and fears and doubts and questions that, that, that you actually can be discovered in that, 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 that those things don't inhibit your grace, those things don't inhibit you, Lord, but they actually reveal you. Move in our hearts, in our lives. Lord Jesus, that you may grow greater. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Lord bless you, brothers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think we've got um, workshop. I think so. The Life and Spirit Seminar starts at 4.30 for those interested in being a part of that this afternoon. Um, or take some time just to be quiet. Uh, and uh, brothers, thank you for being here. I, I, I greatly appreciate your presence here. So God bless you, brothers.